Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm Annalise Riles, Executive Director of the Northwestern Buffett Institute for Global Affairs and Associate Provost for Global Affairs at Northwestern University. Let me start by speaking from my own professional position as an international lawyer. The invasion of Ukraine we have witnessed in recent days is a brazen violation of fundamental tenets of international law and international humanitarian law. Threats of nuclear attack further demonstrate the urgency of nuclear disarmament for global peace and security. So it is not just Ukraine that needs defending today, it is the international legal order. Universities have a special and profound responsibility at moments like these. We are nodes of deep expertise and privileged sites of dialogue. What we say and do at these moments matters far beyond our campus. We're also a community with many deep ties to this conflict, Ukrainian and Russian students, faculty, alumni, and research collaborators. We have an obligation to gather all of this expertise and symbolic capital together to understand root causes and to find and push for solutions that lead to lasting peace. To that end, I wanna thank this esteemed panel of scholars who have taken time to join us today to share their perspectives. Let me introduce each of them briefly. Timothy Brick is the head of sociological research at the Kiev School of Economics. He's a friend and collaborator of several of our faculty and gave a lecture at Buffett in 2020. He joins us from Kiev, welcome. Jennifer Chan, is Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. She has worked with NGOs and UN agencies for over 10 years in conflict zones as a humanitarian physician and data specialist. Ian Hurd is Professor of Political Science and Director of Northwestern University's Weinberg College Center for International and Area Studies. His latest book, How to Do Things with International Law, examines the ideology of the rule of law in international affairs. Olga Kamenchuk is an associate research professor in the Institute for Policy Research and an associate professor of instruction in the School of Communication at Northwestern. She's both Russian and Ukrainian and joins us from Moscow. Ian Kelly is ambassador in residence at Northwestern University and a retired foreign service officer who most recently served as the US ambassador to Georgia from 2015 to 2018. Previously, he served as the US ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe from 2010 to 2013. Jordan Gans Morse is associate professor in the Northwestern University Weinberg School of uh, Department of Political Science, and he's director of Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies at Northwestern. He's the author of Property Rights in Post-Soviet Russia, Violence, Corruption, and Demand for Law. Timothy Milovanov is president of the Kyiv School of Economics and an advisor to Ukraine's presidential administration. He has served as Minister for Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture and Chair of the Board of the Ukrainian Central Bank. He's also Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Pittsburgh. He also joins us from Kyiv. Welcome. Peter Slevin is Professor in the Medill School of Journalism and among his many career accolades, Peter spent seven years as the Miami Herald's European Bureau Chief chronicling the collapse of communism in Central European uh, uh, areas and in the Soviet Union. Michael Rogers is a senior fellow and adjunct professor in the Kellogg Executive Leadership Institute. He retired from the U.S. Navy in 2018 after nearly 37 years of naval service, rising to the rank of four-star admiral. He, he culminated his career with a four-year tour as commander of U.S. Cyber Command and director of the NSA. National Security Agency, welcome. Juliet Sorensen is clinical professor of law at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law's Center for International Human Rights and a nationally recognized expert in international criminal law and human rights law. Via Subramanian is the Walter Murphy Professor of Computer Science at Northwestern University's McCormick School of Engineering and a faculty fellow at Northwestern's Roberta Buffett Institute for Global Affairs. 
VS is a world leader in artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, predictive modeling, probabilistic interference, and machine learning, social media, and counterterrorism. So uh, the panelists will each uh, take turns answering an initial question, and then we welcome your questions through the chat function. There will be instructions in the chat about how to pose a question. We may go a few minutes beyond five. Um, so if any of our panelists have to leave uh, right at five, we understand. Um, and we look forward to this discussion with, with all. So Professor Malovanov, I want to begin with you. Uh, you are an economist, an advisor to the president of Ukraine and a former head of the board of the National Bank of Ukraine. Tell us, first of all, what you are personally seeing and experiencing in Kyiv right now. I think you're muted, Professor Malovanov. Thank you. Uh, just one correction. Uh, all the titles are correct, except for um, I was deputy chairman of the Council of the Central Bank of Ukraine or National Bank of Ukraine, but you know, uh, under the previous presidential administration, under President Poroshenko. Um, well, you know, Timothy Brick is inside Kiev. He will be able to tell more. I'm in the suburbs. I can only tell you that I've been lucky and a bit unlucky, but mostly lucky that I have been able to make it to the suburbs. Uh, but we made it towards the area in which the first initial attack was. So we actually have to re-evacuate uh, the same day from there. Um, I am, you know, what can I tell you today? You know, every day is a new escalation. It, it's, uh, it's a degree of magnitude higher. Today they used, uh, uh, class, Russians used uh, cluster bombs in Kharkiv um, on residential areas. Now they are shutting down, they are blowing up uh, uh, electric generations in Kharkiv and transformation so that uh, people don't have electricity. There was an air raid on Kyiv this evening and three buildings, uh, five floor and three floor buildings were destroyed. Um, that, that means that, you know, the, uh, it's not uh, precise weapons anymore. It's not targeted military installations, you know, and I can't even believe I'm talking about it as if it were normal. Three days ago, it was none, uh, you know, we woke up to the, um, to the mm, missile uh, blowing up, we just didn't know what it was. But, uh, you know, again, Timothy will say more because he's actually inside. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just had to go to a shelter because of a air raid warning. And uh, it, it kind of new normality and new reality. Um, I just think uh, I, I, it's not going to end with Ukraine if Ukraine falls. I think people uh, should understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, and everything, every, you know, all our rationality approach, modeling approach, scientific approach, trying to understand Russia and Putin just simply didn't work. And every time we thought he wouldn't do that, then he would. And it's a pattern. And so it's a bigger picture than just key for something else. So, so we're, I think we're on the, we're already inside a major uh, Russia NATO crisis, whether people are willing to accept it or not. It is there and it will have to be resolved. So as an economist, I, we would really like to hear from you about sanctions. So what kinds of sanctions do you think will be most effective in stopping this and how long will it take for those sanctions to see some impact? Sanctions are not gonna be effective alone in stopping it. It's gonna be military. Uh, it's a military operation, it's a war now. And so uh, sanctions, what sanctions can do, they can make it much more difficult to carry out this war on the part of Russia. And it's, it's almost a technological or you know, technical exercise. You know, if uh, uh, specific people in Russia, decision makers, CEOs, are concerned about securing their assets, then they are spending time on that and they're not spending time on ensuring that supply lines run uninterrupted. And it takes longer for the uh, military to regroup or get refueled and, or something like that. So all that helps. The idea of sanctions that is needed now, if we want it to be more effective, is actually to generate economic panic. The economy runs on trust. If people are worried that tomorrow uh, ruble is going to be 
uh, you know, $200 uh, dollar will be 200 rubles or 2000 rubles or 20,000 rubles, um, there will be hyperinflation. Uh, and the uh, people, you know, officials will start resigning, companies will start closing, and it will put a lot of pressure on the state to resolve this issue. So all sanctions, which are actually making it very difficult uh, for, you, uh, for the Russian economy to operate and make it likely that uh, there will be less trust in the ability of the government to maintain uh, economic uh, stability uh, are very welcome. Is there any particular kind of sanction or economic action that you are really uh, looking uh, for um, Europeans and Americans to take at this moment? So it, uh, yeah, Russia has to be boycotted uh, from every uh, supply chain. Um, here, I'll give you some unexpected ones, but very effective ones. Let's say when the Russian central bank runs out of uh, banknotes, you know, $100 bills, it asks another central bank in Europe to ship it. That's a service. That service could be denied. So that generates panic. If there is a cargo ship shipping something and you know, calls a port, it can be denied uh, refueling. That all works. So all kinds of logistics, because economy runs on international trade and on international financing. Everything which cuts off Russia from international finance and international trade, physically and legally, uh, is effective. Thank you. So, Timothy Brick, let's turn to you now. So, you are in the city center. Tell us what you're seeing and experiencing right now. Well, thanks for this opportunity to talk at your event. Yeah, it has been. Um, quite complicated days. I have to say that these days are blended now. I once talked to my friend and we described it that it's like one very long day with a lot of small naps. So uh, I even started first time in my life to write diary because I, I sometimes I cannot remember the sequences of events or what's uh, what, what happened one day ago or two days ago. So it's quite stressful. But I have to say that uh, Kyiv, just like many other places in Ukraine, uh, stand quite strong and united. And this is good news. And this is, of course, good news for me uh, because it's comforting to be in the, in the place which is uh, united and supportive. So um, most of the time I spend either in my home or in a shelter following uh, our local government recommendations. So we have alarm systems. And sometimes when I can, I go around and I check my neighborhood and actually citizens are encouraged to, to help and make sure that uh, there is no saboteurs because there are a lot of Russian saboteurs in our cities now. My girlfriend and I, we were personally checking for these marks, saboteurs. They leave special marks to target uh, missiles, rockets and bombs. So it is essential for our safety to check for these uh, marks and you know, my girlfriend, she likes climbing. So she wanted to climb our house just to check some marks on the roof. It was pretty dangerous. I convinced her not to do that, but she was very eager to do this. So people are very motivated to check for safety. We are, um, I have to say that uh, the infrastructure works quite well. So we have a lot of shelters. It can be a subway, it can be a basement. Everything is prepared. There is internet, there is light. We have water and running water and electricity in our house. So, so that's fine. So this helps to go through this uh, stress, you know. Uh, and I think very important what I want to stress here is that Ukrainian, there is no, no shortage in, in volunteers. Uh, a lot of Ukrainians exchange information online. We use many different uh, devices like Telegram or WhatsApp. The information spreads very quickly and we all know what to do, you know, if if there is a need to bring water or medicine or warm clothes, people just pick it up and, and either donate it to someone or uh, chat somewhere, we need a car and then car comes to your house and you give the food so they take it to somewhere else. Uh, I was walking by uh, the local army office, it's called territorial defense, so local population can and least to army and uh, you know, I'm not an experienced guy. I didn't know what to do. I just arrived there thinking, well, 
I'll just wait in a line. They will tell me what to do. And you know what? I, I did not get inside because the line was so huge. So, uh, and some men told me that they were waiting from the day before. So no shortage of volunteers, a lot of unity, but what, what I see that we need resources. Yeah, people, people give the last thing that people give their last money to army, people donate their own food, people donate medicine, uh, and and this supply, you know, we, we need to keep it going. That's great to hear. Um, so, uh, Olga, let's turn to you. So you have family in Ukraine uh, fighting in the resistance at the moment. What are you hearing from your relatives? Well, <clears throat> yes, I have family in Ukraine, in the army, fighting with the Russians. I have family who fled, I have family who are hiding in the shelters. It's very stressful. Many Russians and Ukrainians have uh, relatives across the border. So this is one reason why for so many Russians, it's also been quite a shock. Um, I want to state that as, um, my colleagues in Northwestern, I'm quite shocked and abhorred by the war that Putin waged against Ukraine. So currently I came to Russia a couple of days before the war started, plan to, if everything goes well, to leave on March 2nd. Um, I'm currently going to protests, I'm talking with people, I'm analyzing opinion polls, uh, conducting media and social media sentiment analysis and trying to understand here on the ground what is going on, and especially from the protest perspective. Um, and I want to say a couple of words about majority and minority of Russians with regards to that war. Unfortunately, still, and we have to admit it, um, still majority of Russians, uh, one way or the other, are supporting this war. Um, however, it's not that uh, so-called Crimean consensus as the Russian society exhibited following the annexation of Crimea. Uh, eight years ago, 95% of Russians were uh, in favor of a Crimean annexation. Right now we see 57 to 65%, depending on the pollster, uh, what we see. Um, and I think the real numbers are slightly smaller as um, there's quite some fear to give honest answers. That's why we also analyze social media. Propaganda and suppression are big problems for the society here. For example, it's, um, you know, all students, because lots of youth are participating in the protests, all students were told uh, that even if they dare to mention the word Ukraine in social media, they will be expelled right away. Uh, and there's um, special monitoring people, uh, monitoring the cohorts in every university, at least in Moscow, for sure. I know from my relatives here. It's also prohibited to use the word propaganda, uh, to, to use the word war, speaking about propaganda. You have to use only the word special operation in the media and the media which are using the word war, what it is, they, are, they were blocked. So, and all this uh, feeds groupthink and spiral of silence when people are uh, out of fear of isolation. They, they, they think that their opinion is different from the other people's opinion. They tend to conform and limit their expression. But I want to emphasize that even with that, um, you know, even that still we see majority of Russians supporting this conflict or saying they are supporting this conflict, this war, it's not 90%. Um, as it was with the uh, uh, Crimean annexation. And I also want to draw attention to the minority now. Um, and, you know, the ones who are protesting and fighting against this war here. You know, Russia is the state where opposition movement is uh, uh, beheaded. We have no leaders. Uh, some of them are shot, like Boris Nemtsov. Some of them are jailed, like uh, Alexei Navalny. And some of them are exiled, like Khodorkovsky. We have no leaders on the ground. And from that point, it was especially interesting that um, President Zelensky, he twice um, uh, addressed Russians, say, saying that um, he's also seeing that in social media that Russians are shocked, many Russians are shocked by what is going on, and he called them to the streets. And so we have seen um, uh, not only protests in the social media, but also in the streets. Uh, yesterday in St. Petersburg alone in one city, there were over 900 people which were arrested. Um, protests are right now in 27 cities around the whole, uh, around the whole country. 
And um, they are not just arrested, they're beaten up till they are uh, unconscious, like famous uh, philosopher uh, Grigory Yudin. Um, they're not called ambulances. So it's, it's um, so the attitude towards this war is different um, compared to the um, previous invasion. It's not the first invasion that Russia made in, in, in Ukraine. Um, and even though uh, propaganda and suppression are very strong, um, there is quite significant amount of Russians which are resisting. Unfortunately, I'm pessimistic with regards to uh, opposition in Russia, as I anticipate suppression towards uh, opposition only to grow, as Russia is turning more and more into a pariah state, and President uh, Putin becomes more and more dependent on Siloviki or military and special forces. So he'll be crushing the protesters even more. So that's what I'm seeing right now here on the ground. Thank you very much. So Jordan, let's turn to you uh, on exactly this point. So what, in your view, are the root causes of Putin's actions here? And what do you think will be the domestic implications for Mr. Putin uh, and his government because of this war? Thanks, Annalise, for, for having me. And, and thank you so much to um, the Kiev School of Economics uh, guests who joined at, at such great risk um, from, from uh, Kiev. And um, it's, it's an honor to be here with you guys. I'll give you three uh, really quick uh, kind of standard theories about uh, what has been Putin's motivations, and then get to the one that I think honestly is all that we need to know. And, and the three standard ones have been uh, that he has concerns about security uh, due to NATO's expansion and some um, hypothesized idea in his head that somehow Ukraine might join uh, NATO at some point in the future, and that, that would put Russia's uh, security at risk. That's number one. Number two is that it's intolerable to him to have uh, a democratic nation uh, of, of a country that, uh, you know, of a Slavic country that has tight ties to Russia right on his border and creating a, some sort of model that his own people might want to follow. And number three, and one that's become more and more prominent recently, uh, in, his, in his own speeches and his own writings that he's been making public, uh, some idea about some legacy and his, you know, that he's going to uh, make sure that, that Kiev uh, is somehow reunited with, with Russia. And, and certainly all of these may be tied to some root causes and their ties of tension. None of them explain why uh, he actually has gone forward with uh, an invasion that really doesn't make sense in terms of costs and benefits. And that's where we come to the one that I think is most important for people to see is that uh, he is not the same person he used to be. If he ever was pragmatic, it doesn't seem like he is anymore. It seems like something has really gone wrong with his mentality. And that's the part that I think people in the United States who are, are still waking up to the fact that this is not a, a war against just Ukraine, that this is just Ukraine on the front lines of a bigger war that is affecting all of us already. And if Ukraine does not win, will be directly in our face very soon. Uh, that's a point people need to be thinking about. Very interesting, thank you. Um, so Michael Rogers, let's turn now to the military picture. As you're uh, watching um, these events unfold, what are you paying attention to? And uh, what do you see as NATO's best options? So as I look at the Russian military, I see a series of military activities that have failed to achieve their objective that are behind schedule. Um, as you've heard from our, our colleagues in Kiev already, I think their view was we can initially go with, you know, smaller insertions. The Ukrainians likely will not resist us. We can use sabotage and um, covert forces in the major urban areas that we have already inserted. That has totally failed. So you're seeing a bit of an operational pivot. The Russians are committing additional heavy forces. They're up they are really ratcheting up their use of kinetic weapons. So they're going after key infrastructure. You, you heard power, you know, I, I think originally they thought they could do this without significantly destroying significant segments of the infrastructure in the Ukraine. I think they've come to the conclusion that failed them. So you're seeing in some ways the Russians are really doubling down on this. And I expect the, the level of violence, the application of force is gonna significantly increase in the coming days. They're just, they're committed now. And he's got to, from Putin's perspective, he has to win. He, he cannot, you know, allow this uh, a defeat, so to speak. If I look at NATO, it's a defensive alliance and the Ukraine is not a NATO member. So the alliance is trying to project strength. It's trying to support the Ukraine in terms of military weapons, in terms of previously training and other capabilities. 
It is deploying additional forces to the Eastern boundary areas. The US is moving, for example, forces that were previously stationed in Germany, we're moving them forward into Poland and into um, Estonia. You see the Brits and other nations deploying additional forces into Europe. We have announced the US that we will deploy a couple thousand additional forces into Germany to, to try to support the alliance. But NATO's trying to walk a bit of a, a tightrope here. It wants to show commitment and strength. It wants to show that the Russians should not consider moving any further westward, but it does not want to get in a position where the deployment of its forces are perceived by the Russians as in fact attempting to escalate this and to broaden it into a military conflict in terms of Oops, I think you went, you went mute yeah, on us. That so NATO does not want, it wants to show strength, it wants to show resolve. On the other hand, it does not want to use its military capabilities and it doesn't want to deploy forces in a way that um, in fact suggests to the Russians that NATO is interested in broadening this to a kinetic conflict outside of Ukraine. So the Alliance is trying to walk a bit of a tightrope at the moment. Um, I'm sorry, just want to have a correction, and I probably was um, uh, just a mistake. It's Ukraine, not the Ukraine. Thanks, thanks. So, VS, let's talk about the cyber warfare picture. Are, how are the Russians doing? Are they as effective as we expected? And what can the U.S. do to bolster Ukraine against cyber attacks? Hi, Annalise, and uh, hello, everybody, especially our friends from Ukraine. So the Russian playbook has been honed for at least 15, if not more years. And they've honed this playbook in Estonia, in the US, as well as of course, for many, many years in, the, in Ukraine. Their playbook currently consists of adding to their military campaign hacks, uh, which by which I mean traditional attacks, cyber attacks, as well as social media influence campaigns, which are increasingly being thought about as cyber warfare as well. So if you look at the former, the hacks, uh, they've not been as impressive as I had feared would be the case, uh, even you know, 10 days back. Uh, they've injected malware that wipes out uh, computer boot uh, segments of the memory. So basically think about it when your computer boots up, it reads some stuff that's in the hardware of your computer in order to execute that program and get moving. Many, many machines in, uh, in Ukraine have been compromised by having those boot segments overwritten and therefore these machines can't start up. They cannot do their job. And the severity of that is hard to assess right now. It depends on where those machines are and exactly what critical functions they were performing before they went down. In addition, they've attacked a number of government targets through denial of service attacks, which basically means flooding them with traffic and transactions so that they get overwhelmed. So they've done this to a number of banks, to a number of government and military installations. So, you know, looking at their social media campaigns, they seem to be not very well executed, or it could be that they've been so well executed that we're not seeing a number of things that we would expect to flag. So, it's hard to say which of the two it is. I tend towards the former right now. So for example, they put out fake videos of, um, you know, um, for example, of uh, some Ukrainian Russian border, sorry, Ru Russian border posts allegedly being shelled and hit by Ukrainian forces. They put out videos showing alleged uh, incursions of Ukrainian forces into Russian territory with infantry and uh, you know, uh, and ar armed weapons. However, these have largely been proven to be false. And so what we are seeing, and they've been proven to be false with very, very simple instruments. Looking at the metadata attached to these videos, they've been shown to be false. So what that suggests to me is that they've not taken the cyber dimension of this war as seriously as at least I had feared. That said, I wanna caveat that with a couple of comments. One is over the last 10 years, there is no doubt whatsoever that they've injected a very large number of backdoors, that they've injected a lot of malware already into Ukrainian networks. How much of this 
has been activated to carry out some of these attacks, how much of this infrastructure they've left embedded, I do not know because we do not know what has not been activated as yet. So that's something you know I would keep a very close watch on. So cyber warfare um, and the cybersecurity folks in Ukraine, along with helpers in the West who actually are in a position to help Ukraine with that sitting in Washington or sitting in Chicago, that needs to be up. And I'd like to see that happen in a more uh, substantive way. So simply put, you know, I'm surprised that the Russian cyber warfare component has not been as severe as I'd expected. Uh, that said, we do not and cannot rule out the fact that they have a lot more you know, heavy hitting to bring to the table down the road. Thank you. Hey, Annalise, Mike Rogers, can I make a comment? Yes. Because quite frankly, in my previous life, I would have been in the Oval Office and in the sit room talking about so what are we, we really doing with the respect to cyber now? And I, I agree with everything I heard. What's interesting to me is one of the implications of the fact that the Russians have not been as successful as they had hoped and that the sanctions and the political uni unity that they are seeing has exceeded their expectations is that I believe if you're Putin, you are trying to figure out right now, what are my tools that I have to put more pressure on the West? How can I break this you know, unity? How can I increase economic pressure? How can I show the West, you think sanctions have an impact on me economically? Let me show you what I can potentially do to your economy. So I, I say this only because I, I agree. I think we've collectively been surprised that the cyber element has not been as aggressive or as significant. But the flip side is I look for that to change very quickly because I think he's looking for tools right now that he can use to impact, increase the pressure on the West and, and that is a very attractive opportunity for him. So I would think we're about to get much worse in this area than we've been. Can, so, I, can I also add a comment sure. on this? Yeah, so I'm a little bit disturbed by the perspective of the discussion. So it's like, um, it's, uh, it reminds me of the discussion of the Air Force of Ukraine. There was just before the war uh, last week, there was a discussion that, uh, you know, uh, Russian Russian Air Force will just suppress the defense in one day, and then it will be all over. It turned out Ukraine does have air, for, air defense, and everyone was surprised by that. But the discussion here is similar. Do you think Ukraine doesn't have cyber warfare? Do you think there are no cyber attacks on Russia right now, originating from Ukraine and elsewhere? That's one. Do you think we don't have cyber defense? That hasn't been tested and we don't know. But the entire discussion for the last five minutes was about what Russia does and maybe it could do more and I'm very worried. And there's absolutely no discussion about the Ukrainian capabilities in cyber warfare and uh, what Ukraine does. And it has not even been looked at what Ukraine is doing. Similar on the communication front, do you think we're not running deep fakes? Do you think we're not running Stratcom? Do you think we're not targeting social media in Russia where we can? Do we think we're not using Silicon Valley companies to push notifications uh, with videos and pictures to their clients? Do you think we're not using AI companies to identify Russian soldiers? We do. So there's also not discussion about this. Um, and that's, I think, why West consistently gets Ukraine wrong. Thank you so yeah. much. Really appreciate that. Thank I, you. Just a little perspective Please. from Kiev also yes. as more a witness than analytics. Uh, I can also add to that that there is a lot of discipline regarding cybersecurity and fakes. So uh, I monitor so many channels now. I'm on you know, uh, Telegram, Viber, uh, Twitter, and I communicate with friends, colleagues, co-workers, volunteers. And I see a lot of discipline that people are talking about fakes. Every time the news is posted, someone says, did you check your source? Maybe this is fake. And the government is doing uh, a lot of um, educational communication. So we often receive this communication, like make sure that you know your sources. And I remember when the first uh, day of attack happened, uh, a lot of media, um, coordinated and there were there were complaints that media reports very slow and the media like major media they 
post it on their Telegram channel that we are reporting very slow because we want to make sure that we double check our sources with the government. So there is a lot of discipline and I was um, proud of my neighbors because you know usually when when you have a huge house with many neighbors it's always people fighting each other talking over each other and such and such but people are very cautious now and very disciplined and i think this culture uh, also adds in terms of stopping panic which is a goal of cyber attacks sometimes i mean misinformation and, uh, sorry uh, misinformation let me I, i'm sorry about hijacking it but we've gone just to understand the structure so what uh, what happened in 2014 russia was successful in stratcom against us and as a response to that a lot of fact checking services were set up we, for example, at the, the Kiev School of Economics, we set up Vox Ukraine and Vox Czech. And that is a major fact-checking service, which was pushing for the culture. And it has been working with Facebook, Twitter, and others, having major contracts for Central and Eastern Europe verified. So we have trust relationships. Now, the weakness of Russia is that they have not allowed this grassroots or even state, you know, with enough credibility, fact-checking resources. So we have a, an ecosystem of fact-checking resources, which shut down fakes. And that's defense too, which, and Russia doesn't have this defense. They cannot shut down our fakes if we are running them. That is fascinating. Really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. So let's talk about the medical side of this, Jennifer. So we've heard from Timothy about cluster bombs, about the bombing of apartment buildings. Um, tell us a little bit about you know, what, what, what kind of, what is the effect of a cluster bomb on, uh, on human beings? What kinds of um, medical impact are we expecting to see if this escalates in the way that uh, Mike was predicting um, on the, the, the population? And um, what will the medical needs be? Thanks, Annalise. And I wanna thank everybody for um, having part of this panel. I think that in contexts like this with conflict and war, we often talk about the direct effects on the health and well being of individuals, families, communities, and country and nationwide. In the answer to your inquiry about cluster bombs and other um, mechanisms um, that we see directly as related to conflict, so we call this direct trauma, you can see traumatic injuries to the head, you know, the chest, the abdomen. Um, and oftentimes, you know, these are significant. Uh, I also like to talk about the systems related issues and I'll talk a little bit more very briefly about the public health related components of this. Sometimes just access to medical care if the health facility has been moved, um, for which I believe some health facilities have been moved into um, shelters um, can be a limited way for people to access care. Resources, just in many other ways people are talking about access to electricity, water, security, those will all directly impact patient level care. Um, one of the things that we know across different conflicts and wars around the world over decades, and it's been supported by evidence, is what I describe as the indirect consequences of conflict and war. And so this may be related to a comment earlier as we look at the long horizon of what may happen in Ukraine and beyond. We think about the public health consequences and therefore the medical consequences of these types of phenomenon. And in many ways, if we think about what is probably an underestimate of the forced migration that is occurring, which is probably as of maybe early this morning, about estimated 500,000 people on the move, you can sort of frame that related health needs and medical care related needs to 500,000 plus moving a lot within the country and then across multiple borders. And so we would expect that there will be additional healthcare related needs in Poland, Romania, Moldova, and many other places, as well as significant needs within the country of Ukraine. Some specific components that you know, um, are being discussed is the overlay of um, forced migration with what we all know around the world, which is COVID-19. And there has been increasing cases in the region. And so there's an expectation probably that COVID-19 and the spread and its effect on individuals and groups, particularly in very tight spaces as people move to places of safety, move into their friends and families' homes, and, and ongoing concerns of low vaccination rates that the COVID component plus conflict will have a significant impact on, on families and communities. A few extra notes just with regard to the long ripple effect of, of health-related issues. 
is that the World Food Program um, receives a significant amount of its re resources from Ukraine. And so if they think about it as we extend on communities and people around the world for which every single individual's health needs are significant in certain scenarios are important. Although communities who may be reliant on WFP resources um, around the world who would have received them from Ukraine, there is a potential that those types of resources for different reasons will be shut off or cut down or minimized. And there will be those long-term potential health related effects of food insecurity that may, we may see in areas around the world um, quite far from where the conflict has happened. That's fascinating, thank you. So Ian Kelly, let's turn to you. So give us a window into the diplomatic conversations going on. And of course, we, we just uh, witnessed a, a negotiation between uh, the Ukrainian and, and Russian authorities and also uh, lots of diplomatic conversations. Um, what do you think a diplomatic solution might look like? What are the possible off ramps? Thanks, thanks, Annalise. And, and let me just uh, repeat what my colleagues have said, what an honor it is for me to appear, particularly with our colleagues from Kyiv. Uh, I, it's, um, I think it's very difficult, unfortunately, to see uh, a diplomatic off ramp uh, for this crisis. And there's a, I think the main reason for that is that Putin has given some very maximalist demands uh, to, uh, to the United States, to NATO, and of course to Ukraine itself. And um, uh, we've all said these demands are, are unacceptable, that um, Russia basically could dictate the, uh, the foreign policy of a, of a sovereign nation. Uh, there was a kind of possible off-ramp in the so-called Minsk II ceasefire agreement uh, that um, mentioned a kind of uh, autonomy for the Donbass region, um, but with the recognition, of course, of those two uh, statelets or whatever you want to call them, uh, Putin himself destroyed uh, that, uh, that off-ramp. So I think now what, uh, what the international community is looking at is of course trying to keep channels open to Russia. And of course, these talks today and the Belarus border were important, I think, in, in that regard, that uh, the sides were able to, uh, to at least talk to each other. I'd also say that it's very important that there be a mill-to-mill -mill channel set up. Uh, that's what happened in 2008 with Georgia, where the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff talked several times to his Russian uh, counterpart. Uh, but uh, there was an article today, or maybe it was yesterday, that said that um, the two um, heads of, of defense, um, Milly and Gerasimov had not talked, but after these threats uh, that Putin made yesterday about uh, nuclear, um, uh, raising the nuclear uh, preparedness, uh, that becomes, I think, uh, even more important. So the focus really is just on supporting Ukraine, uh, supporting their, their ability to resist the invader, uh, and also uh, supporting it, its uh, growing humanitarian needs. Thank you. So Juliet, let's turn to international law now. What violations of international law and international humanitarian law do these events constitute in your view? And um, I also wanna ask you about the um, uh, Ukraine suit in the ICJ that was recently filed. Um, what do you see as the impact of, of that? Yeah, thank you, Annalise, and thank you so much for including me with these extraordinary experts uh, and viewpoints today. First, I, I want to start by being unambiguous. The actions of Russia are a clear violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and also of Russia's obligations under international law. Now, what does this mean in terms of accountability? Um, there are uh, real practical limitations of um, the, the strength of the so-called long arm of the law when it comes to transnational jurisdiction. Um, you know, the international crime um, of which Russia is manifestly guilty is the crime of aggression. Um, that is enshrined in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Russia's use of armed force against the sovereignty and territorial integrity and political independence of Ukraine is a clear example of the crime of aggression. 
Unfortunately, the ICC has no jurisdiction over non-state parties such as Russia. Um, and by the way, Ukraine is not actually a party to the ICC either, um, although it has accepted the court's jurisdiction. Um, so has no jurisdiction um, over Russia for the crime of aggression unless the matter is referred by the UN Security Council. Um, there we run into another practical problem of the limitations of international law, which of course I don't need to spell out for this crowd, but Russia of course is a permanent member of the UN Security Council and has veto power. Um, now that's not to say that there couldn't be accountability um, for uh, the actions of Russia under international law. Um, that could lie in a few possible ways. Um, the 1949 Geneva Conventions have been ratified by all member states of the United Nations, including Russia. Um, and those, uh, the Geneva Conventions, of course, speak very clearly and in great detail to war crimes. Um, war crimes um, may include uh, actions that are committed against a range of victims. That includes um, combatants in Ukraine. It includes non-combatants, such as civilians. Um, it might include uh, wounded or sick members of the Ukrainian armed forces. Um, it might include uh, prisoners of war. And protection uh, is also afforded under the Geneva Conventions to medical and religious personnel, humanitarian workers, and civil defense staff. Now, having spoken about the limits of the ICC when it comes to the crime of aggression, um, the ICC does actually have the power to exercise jurisdiction over any act of crimes against humanity or war crimes or genocide, if there were evidence of that, um, that are committed within the territory of the Ukraine. And that is because, as I said, Ukraine, and I want to uh, thank Timothy for correcting all of us and for myself repeatedly making the mistake of uh, using the article, the Ukraine. I'm excising it from my vocabulary forevermore. Ukraine, um, because Ukraine, while not a member state, has indeed accepted the court's jurisdiction. Um, but at the end of the day, truthfully, um, the international law mechanisms are reactive um, and they are inefficient. It's not to say that they are not necessary, um, but I've listened with great interest to all of the panelists who are speaking to what can be done now. What can be done now from the perspective of international law is gather evidence and be prepared. Thank you. Well, that's a, a great segue to Ian Hurd. So Ian, you're an expert in international institutions. Would love your observations about the last UN Security Council meeting and also today's meeting in the General Assembly. Thanks. Well, it's been a pleasure to listen to all these contributors. Thanks so much. The attacks have brought the UN back into relevance after uh, you know 10 years or so of being kind of on the sidelines both the Security Council and General Assembly springing into action, and the Human Rights Council too. The resolutions that are likely to come from the Council and the Assembly are gonna reveal the limits of UN legal authority. The Security Council was designed to be powerless when one of the permanent members um, uh, is, is, uh, is accused of wrongdoing and the General Assembly can't take any action on international peace and security matters. So the main effect of all of this is the political one, which is to signal Putin's isolation among other governments uh, and very vividly makes the point that this is Putin's choice of a war and that Russia is largely acting on its own um, and that that is uh, kind of a hallmark of the, uh, of the context. Now notice too though, that diplomacy and power flow through organizations that aren't ostensibly about high politics. Think about the insurance markets, the London real estate market, debt rating companies, FIFA, the International Olympic Committee. Each of these in its own way has an entanglement with the Russian government. And they're all now being forced to decide where they draw the line. And as Joe Strummer and The Clash once said, at a point you've got to decide whether you're working for the clampdown or you're on the side of regular people. And what we're seeing now is that all of these organizations making their decisions 
to kind of confront the costs of the myth that they were previously operating outside of the realm of nationalist politics. Mm -hmm. And we see them now, um, each in their own ways, uh, perhaps taking decisions that further isolates Putin and his enablers, and maybe little by little impose some costs, making life more difficult for them. Very interesting. So perhaps a role for international institutions after all. So Peter, um, finally, um, what is your assessment about the way this war is re being reported in the US in particular right now? Well, it's great to be here with everybody and I could listen to our friends in, in Kyiv all, all night with the details they're, they're offering. So thank you for that. Um, we've certainly come an awfully long way since um, the Vietnam War when Americans waited uh, until the nightly news and Walter for Walter Cronkite to tell us what to think. This is unfolding so rapidly and so much in real time that the quality media is struggling to catch up. Um, and we're seeing so much of so much of what we know in this completely fascinating um, um, sort of agglomeration, snowball running down, you know, rolling downhill of opposition to Putin. Um, and it's so much of it is coming from the visceral scenes that we're seeing on social media. And so when we think of what the media is, even those definitions are up for, for grabs. I've been struck by the professionalism of um, so much of the quality media in this country. Um, you had right before the, you know, in the run-up, one of the things that was kind of interesting, and maybe it's, it's a little inside insidery, but if you remember the run-up to the Iraq war, when much of the American media was, um, happy to report simply what the Bush administration said. You've had reporters questioning whether the Biden administration, whether Tony Blinken and the president himself and their spokespeople really knew what they were talking about uh, with Vladimir Putin, which is, I think, I think bodes well for, for the future. Um, but um, as, our, as our guests have, have said about, I love the, the idea of this ecosystem of fact checkers um, in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, we're seeing that that is one of the great challenges too. And one of the roles of the media this time is to look at that social media and to assess the reports that are coming out of Moscow and real, in real time in Kyiv and provide some context. Um, I think that, that we are seeing news organizations go deep both in person um, with uh, the voices uh, that are live in many cases from, uh, from cities in Ukraine and um, they're going deep on the history and the context so that we have a sense of really what is going on. So um, I'm a glass half full person and right about now, I think the media is doing all right. Thank you. Okay, so we have lots of questions and uh, Professor Milovanov, I'd like to ask you to answer them first, if that's all right, um, along with Professor Brick. So um, uh, one question is, how would Ukraine's membership in the EU, if accelerated and granted, change the dynamic at play? Thank you. Uh, actually, I want to thank the media, the last uh, commentator. You know, there are people who I know personally from New York Times, from Wash Post, from Wall Street, from you name it, from Polit they are in Ukraine now. They are in Kiev. They are, you know, they are risking their lives. Unlike the diplomats, of Western countries, not all, but some, who uh, now some of them left completely, even Ukraine, even the Western Ukraine. Okay, so so that's just one difference, and I wanted to point out. And I, these people uh, are really my heroes who report from Kiev. Uh, what would it change? It's difficult for me to say from the legal or international law perspective. Uh, I understand the strategic communication arguments. So I think a lot of this, including um, submitting um, a case to the United Nations or to the International Court of Justice or submitting a case, notice that um, Zelensky didn't submit a request to join NATO, right? He submitted to, it's, it's political move. It's very, very powerful political move. Uh, Zelensky is amazingly savvy when it comes to communications. So uh, part of this war, is about the public, the court of public opinion. Because Ukraine understands that A, it needs to get agency, B, it needs support of the entire world as much as it can. It really needs it now. And so it's about the public. It's about the attitude towards the war of the public around the world. And I think what Zelensky is doing with all of this is signaling intent. He's clearly signaling intent that he is 
you know, he's not applying to NATO, but he's applying to, uh, to the EU. So he's signaling that Ukraine is a part of Europeans. It's, it's a nation, it's a European nation. Now he is signaling um, that Russia is a war criminal by applying to the court um, and submitting specific uh, claims. So this is to me is signaling to the international community and also to Russian people and to Ukrainian people who we are and what we want to achieve and what the facts on the ground are. Thank you. Yeah, um, I can add please. just from the perspective yeah. uh, of uh, sociological surveys. Yeah. So I think my colleague Timofey Milovanov, he provided this broad picture and the strategic picture. I can also say that lately uh, there has been a trend that many Ukrainians endorsed the idea of joining uh, European Union. And, uh, and I think uh, this move also boosts the morale of Ukrainians and the support of Zelensky. So there is a clearly within support uh, of this uh, move. And uh, from the humanitarian perspective, I think it's also important to keep in mind that right now there are quite a lot of internet uh, displaced people. So a lot of Ukrainians, they moved now to uh, Poland or to Romania. Some of them are just uh, trying to cross the border. Some of them have crossed the border. And I think that uh, any type of, uh, you know, cooperation between countries um, uh, to help displaced people uh, will be very useful. And I think that uh, further integration of Ukraine to Europe will be very useful to resolve this uh, humanitarian crisis, just, you know, just to join sources to help these people. Very interesting. Anyone else want to comment on that? Um, we have a whole bunch of questions about how what is likely to happen next. So people are asking, you know, what is what is the end game here? Is it a division? Is it uh, what is likely to be the end game? And I, I just want to uh, ask our uh, our guests from Kiev to 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 answer that. What do you see as the next most likely um, um, events? Okay, let's well, yeah, assume in the same order. So the, um, I think um, my colleagues on the panel are correct that Putin is committed now and it's gonna double down. So is the Ukrainians, they're committed. And I think the picture is bigger because if you look at the history of Ukraine, we have lost uh, uh, our independence and sovereignty so many times. We had Holodomor, we had Stalin, we had World War II. Uh, I think that's not understand very well that out of, you know, that losses of Ukrainians uh, is uh, estimated between 8 and 14 million people in World War II. So a lot of war for Russia was fought on the grounds of Ukraine. Um, and then in 1917, 1918, we had a, a short pre period of independence and it was brutally suppressed by Bolsheviks. Um, so, you know, we fear really deeply that if we fall now, we actually fall for uh, many, many years. So that, I think that's what we're gonna fight. Um, I think um, Putin has miscalculated quite a bit and inadvertently or because of this mistake has uh, started also some serious domestic political forces or put in motion because a lot of, you know, Putin is gonna get old at some point. You know, he's 69 now. It's probably, you know, two, three political cycles and there will be either a coup or he will have to appoint someone if everything goes soft and smooth. That means that political elites around him start thinking or should start thinking about trans, uh, transmission or transference of, of power, who's going to inherit. And in the process of this inheritance, um, there is a problem that uh, some forces, uh, some elites could kill other elites or could prosecute them, you know, it's Russia. So, and these events actually, uh, I think accelerated that thinking quite a bit. If before it was, you know, maybe another decade, now they're thinking, you know, is it a year? Is it three years? What's next crazy thing he's gonna do? And so I think it's going to create some division. So in that sense, the best outcome for Ukraine and for the world is that he will fall from inside or he will be weakened enough that would have to. But it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna be uh, fast. So I think the end effect, uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine, Russia will continue to double down. Ukraine will pay a heavy, heavy fight. We're looking for a really protracted conflict in the middle of Europe. Um, at some point, NATO, whether 
NATO likes it or not, will have to intervene and eventually uh, uh, Putin will go. Jordan, I see you nodding. Do you want to get in on this? I don't have a lot to add. I think that was a, an outstanding summary and I'm in, in, in full agreement that uh, the, the only way uh, that this ends without uh, some sort of massive world catastrophe or in a horrible scenario and not, not one I predict, but it would be uh, you know, a, a dramatic victory by Russia ends it, but I don't see that. Certainly that's not the direction things are going right now and, and uh, not what I expect, but short of that, uh, a victory, that, uh, an outcome that ends this, that looks good overall is somehow Putin has to go. Um, and somehow that has to be done without, uh, without a nuclear war. And there's only a few ways that, that happens. Having come from inside is, is certainly the best. Well, you mentioned nuclear war, and we've had a few questions about that as well. So for the diplomats and the military experts here, um, uh, how seriously should we be taking Putin's uh, threats? And um, uh, are you concerned about um, actual consequences for the West should there be more intervention on the side of Ukraine? Maybe Ian, Mike, what do you think? Um, so for me, look, a Putin is trying to look for ways to signal to the West, you do not want to escalate this any further, that I have a range of capabilities that will make your worst day look really bad. Now, you also have to acknowledge, and it's bizarre by US and Western standards, the Russians have actually changed their nuclear doctrine in the last decade under Putin. And the Russians have actually argued theoretically that, that you can use nuclear weapons at a tactical level and not trigger a strategic exchange between nation states that leads to mutually assured destruction. In the US and the West, we rejected that 40 years ago. We have argued, look, you can't use nukes at a tactical level. It doesn't matter the size. It's the capability and the significance of the weapon itself. And if you start down this road, you escalate to an unrecoverable level. That has broadly been the West's view on this. The, one of the challenges, I think, it's something that certainly shapes U.S. policy here, because it's interesting. I'm, I'm hearing people, we didn't use this phrase, but I'm hearing this panel talk about regime change. Um, one of the challenges for U.S. policy, we, our stated objective is we want the Russians out of the Ukraine and we want a peaceful discussion about the issues that both the Ukraine, but both Ukraine and Russia have raised. Um, one of our challenges as you're making policy decisions, having been in the White House and sat in the, in the sit room in the Oval Office with things like this in the past, you, you're mindful you want to create pressure that causes Putin to change his risk calculus, but you're also mindful you don't want to create so much pressure that you destabilize the situation and he feels his back is to the wall and he's got no other choices except to go super aggressive and expand this. And so that's kind of, I think, for at least the US leadership and most of the Western entities, that's part of the challenge here. You wanna show resolve and support the Ukraine, but on the other hand, you don't want this to escalate into something much, much bigger. And, and there's no doubt, as Jordan and others have said, it could escalate despite your best efforts. This could escalate out of control, but you, just you're always mindful of this at a policy level. Can I? Can I just drop in? So, so imagine Putin understands that's how the US is thinking. And so that the weakness in this argument or, or in the weakness is that US is gonna stop if it feels that Putin is going to be too aggressive and is gonna escalate even more. Then he will always be signaling that unless he gets Ukraine, unless he gets Georgia, unless he gets Baltics, he's gonna escalate. So if you put it in a game theoretic, you know, strategy of conflict kind of arguments, um, this is not sustainable. He's going to win if this is the argument. Because he's committed, he can escalate, he has much more range to show this escalation. And if the, uh, if the U.S. is responding by trying to not to freak him out to escalate too much, then that's just alone is not enough. There should be another part of the strategy, uh, not just we don't we keep a balance, you know. Because obviously, it, at least to me, it's obvious that this approach is of balancing, of deterring him has not been successful over the last 10, 20 years. 
Yeah, just to add real briefly, I think, you know, I agree with, with uh, Timofey and, and I think we have to avoid falling into Putin's trap here. He wants us to believe there's only a binary choice here, that it's between, um, uh, you know, a, a nuclear Armageddon uh, and, you know, avoiding that Armageddon and doing nothing. Uh, that's what he wants us to think. So we don't do anything, but there has to be some, we have to be able to have more choices than that. You know, Annalise, <clears throat> I wanted to add here, there's actually a discussion. Uh, is Putin really crazy or is he pretending to be such? Uh, and sometimes you think one way, sometimes you think the other way. Like he said uh, recently, a couple of years ago in one of the press conferences, when he was asked about the nuclear threats and all that, uh, he did say that, well, you know, if need be, we will retaliate. Uh, but then, unlike us, unlike them, we will go to the paradise. So this is completely, so that's that's the way he's thinking. So who will be right after everybody's dead? And I always wonder whether it's really crazy or whether it's what Timothy is saying, just kind of a game theory, uh, you know, um, uh, role here playing, so. Very interesting. Jordan, please, you wanna get in on this? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I definitely agree. This has been a long standing debate. And, and there's certainly been moments up until very recently where uh, this has been in everyone's mind. Is he really crazy? Or is this just really Putin being so strategic that he's making us think he's crazy? I think we're past it. Uh, th there's, there's no rational cost benefit analysis that leads him to get to this point. Uh, there's only two choices. He, he's deluded, period. It's a question of is he's narrowly deluded or massively deluded. Narrowly deluded means he's just bad on his intelligence, either because he got fed the wrong intelligence or he wouldn't believe it, which was that he actually thought that he could easily and quickly conquer Ukraine and that a lot of Ukrainians would be happy to see him. Uh, that's narrow. That, that's the narrow version, which hopefully it is because that's fixable. Uh, the other is, is massive delusion where he really is, is not fully in touch anymore with his, his, his uh, either his ability to uh, make cost uh, benefit decisions or uh, more broadly with um, uh, kind of the connection between those decisions and, and the legacy that he's trying to leave. Um, but either way, I, I think we, we got to move past this idea of, of trying to guess, you know, how, how super genius is Putin? I mean, I certainly have, have partaken in that for, for many years, um, but he just pulled the trigger already on something massive. Uh, and that, that has to change how we think about, about him fundamentally. Thank you. Well, Vias, I see you've got your hand up, but I, I, we're, I want to give the last word to Timothy, if that's okay. So, Timothy, we have a lot of people asking the following question. Um, what, as people of, of Ukraine, would you like to see American people, ordinary citizens, do right now? Well, we can't hear you. We have two Timothys, that's why I'm always getting confused too, but uh, I'll do my part and then Timothy maybe can do the other. Uh, so, okay, fundraising. Uh, I'm fundraising, it's on my Twitter. We're using it for humanitarian relief. Everyone is, we really need money. It really matters. It matters today. It, it is, you know, $500, $100 might save life. Okay, that's one thing. Second, critical supply chains. We might think whatever we want about grand strategy, but the war is now fought on flows, not stocks. What I'm trying to explain is, you know, Russians have difficulty supplying their tanks with diesel. And so do we, whoever has better supply chains is gonna hold Kyiv, okay? So we have access to the West and apparently, so apparently Putin forces are either non-strategic enough or too stretched to blockade the West access. So we should be able to run those supply lines. And that includes food security, that includes water, that includes medicine, that includes everything. Then cultural diplomacy. Agency, you know, I've been calling on, you know, thank you for taking us on this panel. This is fantastic. Please have more events like that. Please talk, please don't let it die two weeks from now or four weeks from now when media gets used to it and it's gonna be old story, whatever it is. Because if Ukraine falls, Baltics are next. You know, and whoever is thinking that somehow it's going to be different, I, I completely agree with Jordan. I think that, you know, he just pulled the trigger. It's over. You know, whatever you think he is not going to do, he will do. So, you know, um, and then humanitarian effort after that. Thank you. Thank you. Timothy? Yeah. 
Yeah, I will add a couple of words to that. Um, I think also solidarity matters. A lot of people believe that solidarity is something, you know, not tangible. And but uh, I just I can compare what is happening now with what was happening in 2014 during the first invasion of Russia. It was so difficult to convince Europeans and Americans to stand by Ukraine. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that what Ukraine was and didn't care about Ukraine and believed in uh, misconceptions about Ukraine. So we were doing eight years of diplomacy, of cultural exchange, of events, uh, media publicity, and simple face-to-face -face conversations. And I think all this uh, created the infrastructure of trust and partnership. So it was more easy to activate these uh, contacts now. So Western partners were mobilized so quickly. So solidarity matters. This is one. But then I will return to the point of Timofey, my colleague, that uh, we need your help in terms of fundraising. Indeed, I see it with my own eyes on the streets that, you know, there is a list of supply that soldiers, army always ask for. They ask for helmets, they ask for bulletproof vests, they ask for uh, food, medicine, uh, portable gas, whatever. And, you know, $50, $100 saves life. And uh, there are many ways you can support. You can check your U local Ukrainian community. There are plenty of them in, in Chicago and uh, elsewhere. Uh, local Ukrainian church, check Twitter, check tele just Google Ukraine support. There are plenty of English um, pages. And our own university, Kiev School of Economics, we decided to run our fundraising. Uh, we have legal registration in the US, so it's a you can trust uh, that your wire will go through and you basically go to our website, you check whatever, it's now artificial, you just select whatever, um, um, I don't know, activity you want to support, but please know that all money will go to army and volunteers. I just want to make sure, I don't know if everyone can see, oh, there you go, Timothy, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and just, uh, let, let me just uh, clarify one thing, yeah. what we are doing is not going to go to the army. If you want to donate oh, to the army, uh, the National Bank of Ukraine, it's widely publicized, just uh, Google it up, National Bank of Ukraine and army support. Uh, that's all official, you can give it to the National Bank of Ukraine money, uh, send it, you know, it's international accounts, and then they will send it uh, th through government. Basically, you're giving money to the government, but it's going to be targeted uh, or earmarked to that. We're doing humanitarian relief, so at most, we're going to give some protective gear, you know, to people. That's the the, the highest we're going to do. But it's going to be medicine, it's going to be paying for transportation from Western Ukraine to Kiev or to some other cities, food, uh, you name it, okay? Thank you. Well, um, Timothy, in response to your point about don't forget about us, I think that we can commit, we are not going to forget about you. And uh, I'm so grateful to my incredible colleagues on this call who are already organizing all kinds of other events. Jordan has plans for lots more things. Uh, we will continue this conversation. This is just the start. Um, and we are with you, um, and uh, please uh, call on us to help you in any way that you need. It's an honor to be with you today, and thank, thank you again thank to you. all my colleagues. Thank you, and uh, one more request. We've, we've suffered from this so long. Don't discuss Ukraine without Ukraine. We sometimes don't have you know, the patience. We sometimes don't have the same culture. We don't have the same experience. There are not as many academics as we have, but there are enough Ukrainian academics. There are enough people like us who, you know, we might be emotional, but please understand us. You know, we are fighting, you know, we're trying to survive. Uh, and so, um, you know, please don't discuss Ukraine without Ukraine. Absolutely, absolutely. I think our concern is not to uh, to tax you further, but now that we know that you're willing to participate, you're going to hear from us all the time. So, thank you so much, everyone, and this is to be continued. Thank you. Bye.